Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Just a Drop's Women in Development webinar for International Women's Day. What a great day it is, and what a great day to be able to celebrate women and to celebrate with all of you. I'm privileged to be a trustee for Just a Drop and your moderator today. Uh, my name is Anne Jocelyn, and I'm an infrastructure advisor in the UK's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office. I've been working in development for over 25 years um, and have been specializing in water sanitation and hygiene for over half of that. Um, I have, uh, I have, yeah, let me, let me move on from me, sorry, um, and let you know a little bit about International Women's Day. So International Women's Day, which is actually on Monday, the 8th of March, is a global day celebrating the economic social, cultural, and political achievements of women, the day marks a call to action for accelerating women's equality. In preparing for today, I was really surprised to discover that International Women's Day has actually occurred for well over a century, with the first gathering in 1911, supported by over a million people. So this isn't new. And for this year's International Women's Day, we know there are events being held around the globe with, I expect, millions of participants. However, according to the World Economic Forum, at the current rate of change, none of us will see women's equality in our lifetimes, nor will many of our children. In fact, women's equality will not be attained for almost another century. So there's still a lot of work to do, and that's why we're here today. We at Just a Drop want to use this day to shed a bit of light on the issue from the perspective of water, sanitation, and hygiene. This year's theme is Choose to Challenge. So today, we want to choose to celebrate women's achievements, raise awareness against bias and inequality, and take action for equality. Collectively, we can all help create an inclusive world. So how will this we webinar work? We've got four absolutely amazing women who you will see in a minute, and we're gonna have a bit of a chat. I'm gonna ask them a few questions, which they will, I hope, as we'd expect, answer. When we've done that, we'll have a few minutes for you to ask them some questions too. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, you're probably familiar with Zoom, you'll see the chat function. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to post them in chat and we'll have Alice in the background uh, just monitoring those questions and raising a few of them at the end of the meeting. We're also recording this session so you and others can watch it later. So just letting you know about that. And if you're one of those people who like to post on social media, then I would encourage you to post about this webinar using the hashtags JAD webinar, hashtag Women's Day, and hashtag choose to challenge. So without further ado, let's meet our panelists. So panelists, I'm gonna ask each one of you to take about a minute to introduce yourself and tell us why are we talking to you today? Fiona, let's start with you. Hi, Anne, um, and thanks ever so much for inviting us today. And, um, and lovely that all of you that could join us this morning. So I'm Fiona Jeffrey, and I'm the founder and chair of Just a Drop, an international water and community-led development organization. And I set Just a Drop up in 1998, um, whilst I was running the international travel and tourism industry event, um, World Travel Market, which takes place here in London. And at that time, I, I'd just become a mum. And I learned the dreadful impact, not having basic access to such a thing as safe water, was having on women and children and girls in particular. At, at that time, a child died every 17 seconds from dirty water. And as a, as a young woman and, and, and mum, that, that really hurt me. Um, it's now every two minutes. Um, 
So I decided at that point in time to encourage my world, the business and the travel world, to have the opportunity to make a difference, um, to support women and children in a, and communities in a very personal and direct way. So that as businesses, we were making a positive social and environmental contribution, as well as an economic one, with the basic premise that if we could all work together, then collectively we could make a difference. And, and that's what Just a Drop became about, really. That's fantastic, Fiona. And, um... What a, what a great organization you've started and, and a great movement. Uh, Melissa, how about you? Why are you here? Thank you, Anne. So I'm Melissa Campbell, Senior Programs Manager for Just A Drop, and I've been here now for nearly 10 years. And during my career, I spent several years on and off living and working in Kenya. And for a time, I didn't have running water in my house, and I found out quite how difficult and backbreaking it is to carry jerry cans of water back home and also working with schools and communities in kenya it was so clear that no development could take place unless people had water so this really influenced my desire to work in the wash sector uh, and also as a mother of two teenage daughters we talk a lot about feminism and gender equality as well as period poverty um, i get called a period ball quite quite frequently but um, talking about the impact that this has on on girls and women great welcome Kendi you're joining us from Kenya why why are you with us today hi thank you for inviting me Anne uh, my name is Lillian Kendi I have been working with Africa Sundam Foundation for the past three years as a communications officer um, here in Kenya, we, due to climate change, we have faced a lot of adverse effects in the weather patterns, which have led to intense water scarcity in the arid and semi-arid lands. As a result, women and girls suffer most from these effects of water scarcity, which disrupts their entire lives as they spend most of their time sourcing for water, which hinders them from proper education and a chance to pursue their dreams. So working with SDF in partnership with Just a Drop, we have been in the forefront of steering development in Southeastern Kenya in the implementation of sustainable water projects to solve the challenge of water scarcity. Uh, personally, it's my dream and vision that all girls and women in the rural communities of Kenya have easy access to water as this will ensure their confidence is restored, their security and personal love for themselves, good education and improved living standards. So I look forward to women having access to clean water here in Kenya. Thank you. Andy, I love that vision. That's brilliant. Um, so lastly, Nancy, why are you here with us today? What are you everyone? Thanks, Anne. Yes, um, so I'm Nancy Stone. Um, and I am a hydrogeologist. I work um, for Wood Group in the UK um, in the field of water resources and environmental protection. But I also have been supporting Just a Drop um, as a volunteer for about five years now um, in my technical role as a hydrogeologist. Um, so yes, I, d I must say the theme of our discussion today really strikes a chord with me. Um, I feel so strongly about working to advance women's equality. Um, I myself grew up in a family of strong and fiercely independent women um, and I work in a fairly male dominated sector where I am and now with two young daughters of my own faces the, facing the challenges of homeschool through the pandemic. Um, so yeah, so w when I was um, back when I was just a fresh graduate, I worked in um, southern e Ethiopia. When I was about 25 um, and it was unfortunately the middle of a famine during that time um, and I got to know the amazing women in the community um, during that time pretty well and it really drove home to me what a, an enormous mountain um, gender inequality is um, was then and still is now due to the burden of water collection and lack of sanitation. Thanks, Nancy. I can relate to that growing up in a family of strong women and then coming into a male dominated career. So I relate to that very well. Great. Thank you, ladies. Uh, I think we will move on to the questions and get into the heart of, of our discussion today. So um, our first question, why is it the case that women and girls are tasked with collecting water? What's the impact? 
Melissa, what do you think? Well, I would say Anne, a key problem is power and the lack of power. So despite the progress that has been made towards gender parity, as we've been saying, women are generally excluded and marginalized from decision making in the economic and political sphere in much of the world. So due to societal, cultural norms, the more menial tasks are mainly carried out by women and girls. Jobs such as collecting water, as we've been talking about. So in the areas where we work, most people don't have access to water close to their homes. And in eight out of 10 households, it is the women who are responsible for water. And then this has a knock-on effect on time. If women and girls are spending all day fetching water, there's, there's no time left for anything else, especially for education or for economic opportunities. In 2016, UNICEF said that women and girls spend 200 million hours every day collecting water. I mean, that's phenomenal, 200 million hours every day. And women also tend to be the main carers. So when family members are sick and poor water and sanitation, you know, leads to a lot of sickness, this has a further knock-on effect on time. Another impact is the effect on, on education. If a school lacks water and adequate toilets, it's incredibly challenging for children to go to school, especially for girls and especially during menstruation. And alongside this, for many girls, their first experience of a period is that they don't know what it is. Many parents and teachers, guardians, they're unable to articulate what menstruation is. And instead there are a lot of myths and stigmas and rules, rules about what a girl or woman can or cannot do during her period, including sometimes not actually being allowed to go to school. And you're certainly not gonna be able to go to school or workplace if you can't afford sanitary products, which means women and girls are often trapped at home, home missing out on education and work. If you consistently miss school every month due to your period, you're far more likely to fall behind and drop out of school completely. And finally, it's difficult not to mention COVID. As we know, water and soap are key weapons in fighting COVID, but it's difficult to prioritize water for hand washing if you spent all day collecting it and you need it for drinking and you need it for cooking. And sadly, we've seen all over the world that COVID has exacerbated inequalities with more women losing jobs than men and taking on additional childcare uh, responsibilities there's been an increase in domestic violence and widespread school closures have led to an increase in teenage pregnancies and more girls dropping out of school. Thanks, Melissa. Some really important points there. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't get an education, then that affects your earning power, your income, household income for the rest of your life. So, so Kendi, uh, let's come to you. Melissa's talked about the general issues. What can you tell us about the situation in Kenya? For example, can't the communities just move closer to the water source? Um, thank you. And unfortunately, the communities cannot move closer to the water source. Um, first of all, in, according to the Kenyan constitution, in Article 67, Riparian land is public land, hence should not be allocated to anyone. And also in Article 62, on the other hand, it states that all rivers, lakes, and all land between high and low water marks are public land. So this is a vivid reason why the community members are prohibited to reside closer to the water source. Locals in the rural areas own large pieces of land for farming and livestock rearing where they have established their homes. So they cannot move their homes and go and live nearer to the water sources. In addition, the rivers that flow mostly in this region are seasonal, so neither can they all fit living along the river sources. So hence the best solution is bringing the water closer to their homes. Uh, in this, for this reason, Africa Sundown Foundation in, past, in partnership with Just a Drop have been solving the water security menace by upgrading the Sandam projects. So while we build the Sandam projects and we build the rock catchments, communities can have water nearer their homes where they can walk to less than 100 meters to fetch the water. 
In addition, we have also started the pipeline projects, which bring the water closer to the community members, rather than having them relocate nearer to the river. So by this means, the community members will have water in a central place within their villages, where they can walk for very short distances to fetch water and go back to their homes without wasting any time and without straining themselves, either financially, physically, or even socially. Yeah, thank you. That, that's really interesting. Thanks, Kendi. Uh, it's really interesting to hear about the, uh, the regulations and the restrictions on movements in Kenya. Can you give us an example of uh, how long would it take a typ typical woman to collect water before our project, and then how long after? Okay, well, before the, the Sandam projects are constructed, community members rely on scoop holes along the river, which are near them. So this would take them, let's say, three, three kilometers away from their homes, which would be around one and a half hours going, then one and a half hours coming back. And during the drier periods when the rivers are completely dry, the communities will have to, to walk longer distances and they will have to use more time as they're searching for rivers which have water. But once we have the Sandam projects constructed, which are constructed alongside shallow wells, the community members spend lesser time because it takes around, let's say, 10 minutes pumping the water, getting your jerry can filled, and let's say around 30 minutes going back home. So the time is shorter. The time used to fetch water and the time used to go back home is shorter as compared to when they go and dig scoop holes. And when the riverbed is dry, you have to go looking for other scoop holes or looking for a place where the, the riverbed has water. So with the, the sand and projects in the shallow wells, the community members have to, can save more time and engage in more income generating activities or other productive activities as compared to when they have no sand and projects. Thanks, Kendi. That gives us a really good sense of what, what it looks like for a woman in, in Kenya. So question two, Nancy, how does, how does access to water actually improve equality for women? Um, thanks, Anne. And yes, I think, Kendi, you were just starting to touch on this and, and also, as Melissa explaining, um, the kind of the, the big problem is that it's really clear in many countries that a key driver of gender bias and inequality is due to that disproportionate impact of the lack of safe water and sanitation and how that combines to affect women and girls much more than men and boys. So, um, so the work that Just a Drop are doing on the ground, we, we really see it makes a huge positive difference for the whole community, but, but particularly for women and girls, because we do combat those issues from a number of different angles. So firstly, um, bringing safe water close to homes. Um, so let's say within a kilometre, maybe even closer. Um, so girls are more likely to be able to go to school. Uh, families are healthier um, and women have much more free time potentially allowing them to have other occupations um, so for example could allow for income generation but you know fundamentally unlock, lock, unlocking them from that cycle of drudgery and um, secondly um, inclusiveness um, something that we think a lot about in our projects uh, we really encourage the voices of women to be heard um, for example in community meetings we involve them in design um, uh, potentially um, involving them in things like well selection in terms of the location. Um, we make sure that women make up the majority component of water user committees um, who are then responsible for managing the water supply in the long term. Uh, we also encourage women to take leadership roles within those committees um, and provide training in governance and bookkeeping and minute keeping. So thirdly, sanitation. Um, so on the sanitation front, um, by providing toilets that are closer to homes, we are really fighting against that indignity and insecurity that may otherwise be experienced by, sadly, by so many women and girls who might otherwise be vulnerable um, to attacks, walking to and using far away um, toilets or even open defecation sites. Um, so for example, the work that we're doing in Cambodia, we're working with families to um, provide household toilets and that really helps to protect women and girls, both from physical attacks, but also um, from snakes, um, mosquitoes, and the indignity of finding somewhere to private um, to go, often in the pouring rain. 
um, fourthly schools were constructing separate toilets for girls and boys and girls with washrooms importantly um, and also accessible toilets for those who have disabilities so really being inclusive there uh, we set up wash clubs so that's water and sanitation and hygiene um, for the kids and in some cases for example in Uganda and Zambia um, we're providing menstrual health and hygiene training um, and reusable sanitary pads so all of that's combining to keep children but also especially girls in school um, so finally um, bringing clean water and toilets to health centers um, it's an absolute game changer for communities but especially pregnant women and women with small children um, for example, in Uganda, uh, running water in health centres, um, we've seen a reduction in sepsis um, and also an improvement in maternal health. Um, can you imagine giving birth and there being no water to wash with, um, no washroom and dirty toilets? Um, it, it must be absolutely horrendous. So, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I love that example of open defecation in, in, in Cambodia. That was my first experience with, with open defecation. So I've got a, a bit of a heart um, and, and, and I can picture the villages that you're talking about. Uh, Melissa, do you want to come in and give us some, some of your thoughts? Thank you, Anne. And yes, I wanted to uh, talk about a village I visited in Zambia in November 2019, which had a really powerful impact on me. There was no borehole in the village and we walked in the blazing sun down to the stream where they fetched their water from. And while we were there, a lot of cows kept coming backwards and forwards through the stream, stopping drinking, defecating. And there was a, a log across the stream with some children playing on it. And periodically they just would put their hands down, scoop up the water right by the cows and drink it. And we weren't surprised to hear that there were high levels of uh, water-related sickness in the village. Um, and whilst we were there at the stream, a 20-year-old woman called Mpatisha came to fill up her two jerry cans. She attached them to her bike and pushed it up the hill with her baby strapped to her back. And I, I have to say, I took the bike and pushed it myself for a bit and it was unbelievably heavy. And she did this twice, sometimes three times a day and each trip took her two and a half hours. So that's potentially seven hours a day, every day, just to collect water. And she also said that women continue to fetch water right up until they give birth, um, you know, which can cause all sorts of health problems, including miscarriage. And they sometimes only have a few days off after giving birth before they're back on water duty. So it, it was quite shocking. Um, so, we put a, um, a borehole in last year, right very close to her house. Um, and the village had set up a committee and the majority of whom are women to manage the water. And we provided training around this on governance and bookkeeping. So we really look forward to visiting in Patisha and, and the village uh, as soon as we can. And also I just wanted to, on that point mention about, about education around hygiene because it is critical alongside the provision of safe water. If you put safe water into a dirty jerry can, you're still likely to get sick. As Fiona said, you know, a child dies every two minutes from a water related disease. So it's absolutely vital that you've got that improved knowledge alongside improved facilities. And I, I wanted to mention another example. Um, about you know there's a lot of potential with supporting women with accessible low interest rate loans working with a community in wakiso district in uganda we put several wells into a large village a few years ago we visited some of the women from the village last february in the heady days when we could still travel and um, on a previous visit these women had explained to us that while they did have more time now now they had wells near their homes they couldn't actually do anything with it as a lot of capital as a lack of capital hindered their options for income generating activities so we therefore provided several women's groups with revolving loans and we provided training and many have started or expanded their businesses so we visited uh, a woman her she had a hairdressing salon and she was now employing other women in it um, we went to sort of saw women's farms and they were expanding their crops, so able to sell more crops. Um, 
and one who was a widow who had started building houses to rent. Um, and and that the determination of these women to succeed really brought home the possibilities that there are once people have water. Well, you've given us all, you and Nancy have given us some great examples there. So climate change. Um, communities are, are experiencing irregular weather patterns with more high intensity events like floods and droughts. And these are further escalating the water problem. Um, there are, there, there's big impacts on communities and there's more weather related disasters that we're seeing happening. So what's the impact of all of this and what can be done? Nancy, you're the hydrogeologist. Do you want to talk about this first? Thanks, Anne. Yeah, no, it's good to talk about climate change today. Um, and yes, you're right. Um, well, in some countries around the world, the threat of climate change is still sort of hovering somewhat in the future. But where we're working, um, often very water scarce areas, uh, we're certainly seeing climate changing right now, um, including, as you mentioned, both droughts and the floods end of the spectrum. Um, and I'm just thinking in my head of recently, so droughts in Zambia, um, so late failed rains in Kenya, for example. Um, we've also seen increased um, extreme flooding events in Uganda and Cambodia. So yes, yeah, certainly a, a problem today. Um, so it's that backdrop really of predicted climatic extremes, um, but together with future pro population growth and also increased demand, which is, is putting increasing pressure on water security, both now and also in the future. And of course, then therefore on already marginalized women and girls. Um, so yes, very important. I um, in terms of what can be done to mitigate against this, um, so we recognize it's very much not a one size fits all in terms of what type of water supply um, might help to improve access to water. Um, and certainly resilience to climate change and environmental sustainability is firmly at the front of our minds. In fact, um, most of our projects focus on developing groundwater as a long term sustainable source of drinking water. Um, so we drill boreholes that tap into groundwater that's stored underground in local aquifers. That's rocks that hold water um, where suitable. And, and really, as, a, as, a, as an option, this has got climate resilience built in, so to speak. Um, groundwater is well known to be well buffered against short term variations in, um, for example, rainfall. It also has major advantages in being generally clean and available year round. Um, so groundwater is good. Um, and as engineers, we do also think a lot about borehole design to make sure that we're not risking pulling down the water table in the aquifer around the borehole. Um, we're also um, very careful to, um, to be sure about what the rate of pumping should be that won't lead to, for example, water levels uh, falling down to actually dry up borehole. We're very careful looking at the natural um, ups and downs of the water table. We carry out pumping tests to look at the sustainable yield. And we also think about what's going on in the nearby catchment, other abstractions as well. Um, so yeah, so as I said, groundwater is good. It's not an option everywhere, however. So rocks are not the same everywhere. Um, and um, some rocks are better than others at holding and storing water and letting it flow around. Um, so where the underground geology is not really suitable for developing groundwater, or maybe we need water at a particular location, uh, for example, a school, maybe on top of a hill. Um, we need to look at other, other ways to improve access to water. So I'm really thinking about capture and storage of rainwater um, and surface water runoff here. Um, that's building another layer of resilience to our project. Um, so rainwater harvesting schemes, rock catchment schemes, and also sand dams um, built across um, seasonal rivers. That's rivers that um, only flow during the raining season. And these are a great um, way of holding, like catching and holding water back in the catchment, letting it soak into sandy deposits upstream of the dam um, and catching it there to let people use it um, into the dry season. Um, now, I'm not going to talk too much about sand dams because I'm about to pass to Kendi, who's going to talk about this in terms of our Kenya project. Um, and I think she's also going to touch on the more holistic angles of projects in Kenya's that promote or support um, food security and income generation, including things like land terracing, um, tree planting um, and training in drought, drought resistant crop varieties um, to support that. So I'll pass across to Kendi now, I think, to tell you a bit more about our Kenya project. Thank you. 
Thanks, Kendi. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, so here in Kenya, uh, climate change has really affected the rainfall pat patterns. Uh, rivers, flows, and sea levels all over the world have also been affected. So to solve the water problems, we need long-lasting and sustainable innovations that are cost-effective and easily managed to conserve water resources. These conservation strategies may include land conservation, conservation structures, footplain management, and watershed restoration, among others. So for Africa Sundown Foundation, an NGO based in southeastern Kenya, we have been solving the issue of water scarcity in arid and semi-arid lands through the implementation of sustainable projects, such as construction of sundown projects along seasonal rivers and construction of rainwater hub schools. Sundown is a reinforced concrete wall, which is built across a seasonal river. It is a low maintenance technology that retains rainwater and recharges groundwater. A sundam can hold two to, two to 35 million liters of water, and it's the world's lowest cost rainwater harvesting solution. Uh, for seasonal, seasonal rains quickly fill the dam with water and soil. The soil is made up of both silt and sand. So the heavier the sand sinks behind the dam, whilst the lighter silt washes downstream. So sand accumulates until the dam is completely full of sand up to the spillway of the sand dam. Water is stored within the sand, making up to 20 to 40% of the total volume. So this means the water stays below and the sand above, and this also prevents it from evaporation of the water. So to safely abstract clean water from the sand dams, we use pipe filtration or shallow and pumps. So the communities are constructed for shallow and pumps just beside the sand dam, which help them access the water that is stored beneath the sand. And the water is usually clean and pure because it is protected from any contamination. Then in addition to the sand dam projects, we also construct rain harvesting projects which are environmentally friendly and long-lasting projects. In school, we construct water tanks which harvest water from guttering systems. Then in the communities, we construct rock catchments which are offshoots that harvest water from rocks into the tanks. Then having successfully administered water security, we train communities on smart agriculture practices such as soil and water conservation through terracing, seed banking, reforestation, and improved organic farming. Uh, a group example that has been supported by both Africa Sandam Foundation and Just a Drop is Kwavo Kisel Help Group, which have constructed around three sandams as at the moment and the members have experienced tremendous change in their lives because through the water that has been harvested by the Sandam projects, they have been able to engage in farming activities, they have been able to plant trees, and the women in those communities are actually established vegetable gardens whereby they sell, they have planted various vegetables, they sell and earn an income from these projects. In addition, the, the Sandam projects have holes enough water that can last the community throughout the whole year, despite the drought seasons being encountered. And owing to the fact that we experience two rainy seasons, the long rains and the short rains, the communities are able to access water in between before the rainy period. So these projects are cost effective and it ensures the community members have water throughout the year without struggling. Thank you. That, that's fantastic. Thanks, Kendi. Thanks, Nancy. Um, Fiona, we've been hearing the word sustainability a bit in there. Do you want to talk a bit about sustainability of our projects? Hi, thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, I think sustainability of our pro I mean, that's the, it, it sits in the DNA of Just a Drop. It's a fundamental principle for us um, when we set up um, is to be culturally and environmentally sensitive to the local setting because 
by doing that, we were able to commit to being sustainable in the long term. And, and too often I had seen previously sort of discarded hand pumps introduced by well-intended organizations, um, but then they were left unused and they were falling into disrepair. And to my mind, that felt highly irresponsible. Um, and I didn't see the point in it, if I'm honest. Um, and uh, it was irresponsible on a number of fronts. One to the communities, fundamentally, who had previously been supported by a facility, but no longer were, um, nor did they know how to fix it. Um, and so that meant that particularly for women and girls whose, whose lives had been alleviated from, from providing that, that, that facility, were suddenly going right back to ground zero again. And so that, that seemed really unjust and, and unfair, and there was no continued progress. Um, and nor, and I felt this as a businesswoman really strongly, um, nor was it right or just to our funding partners, because um, at the end of the day, their, their, their generous donations were, were, were being squandered. So, so one of the lessons I learned in setting up, just to drop it from the outset, was, or I vowed that no matter what our size, um, we were not going to be that organisation. Um, and so that really shaped our, um, our modus operandi with the commitment to finding and developing solutions that were sympathetic to the local habitats and cultures that involved the local communities, ensuring that women um, were at the heart of the decision making right from the outset um, they were they also got involved in the construction and so had a vested interest in everything that was being created and and then to support all of that it was about investing in the necessary training to equip the communities to be able to um, to, to look after the programs and the projects you know potentially after just a drop had gone um, and and the women what was lovely is that the women are really keen to learn you know, they were really motivated, they wanted to improve their skills. And it also helped, you know, inspire the children. And I remember going to Borehole, Melissa and I were, um, I think it was Uganda, weren't we? And um, we went to this borehole and, the, and four young men put, pulled it apart, cleaned it and put it, all, put it all back together again. And I asked one of the young, young lads, I said, well, how long does it take you to learn how to do this? And he said, um, three to four months. And, um, and, I, and he said, but you know, my family's really proud of me. My village and my community are really proud of me. And, and now I want to be a mechanical engineer. And it's by equipping and empowering communities that can flourish once they've got access to water, that it really gives you hope and you know that you are transforming lives and it makes that that valuable difference but but as an organization we also committed very early doors to monitoring our projects for a minimum of seven years so we've embedded that into our philosophy of of good practice and and we feel that through that we can make sure that the communities really do know how to look after the programs and projects that that enables the work to be sustainable and, and very importantly, that funders can be confident that they've invested wisely, they've invested sustainably, and, and so it becomes a win-win for everyone. Um, so, so yes, that's, that, that's our sort of commitment to ensuring that we can um, deliver sustainable projects and mitigate climate change as much as we can. Super. Thanks for that. Some really great examples in there. So one last question from me. And then we'll move on to questions from our participants. The theme for this year's International Women's Day is a challenged world is an alert world. And from challenge comes change. So to challenge ourselves, what kinds of actions can we as individuals, as companies, or as organizations do to support women who do not have access to water or to sanitation or to hygiene? Nancy, let's come to you. Um, thanks, Anne. Yeah, huge, uh, huge topic to finish on here. <laughs> what can we do? Um, so, yeah, so for a starter, I think really webinars like this are a great way um, of raising awareness about these issues. Um, 
and talking about these things um, is such an important part of galvanizing actions, I do believe. Um, I don't know how everyone else is feeling after a year of um, lockdown, but I do feel like we've become quite internally facing generally as a society and we're kind of not necessarily opening our eyes as much as we did and I think we need to get everyone thinking about this more um, about what's going on in the world um, so yeah awareness raising is so important um, and um, also slightly maybe off topic but everyone all of us regardless of our skill set obviously I'm a hydrogeologist but everyone has got their own things they can contribute we can all help to um, accelerate gender equality just where we are making progress on a kind of a bigger scale celebrating women's achievements and being more inclusive in our teams that we work in um, which I think will combine together to have a really accumulative and big effect um, so volunteering is a great way we can all um, get involved um, for my part um, uh, I found just a drop is so welcoming of volunteers um, and I, I really find volunteering is a brilliant experience. I know I can make a difference. Um, having lived and worked through what turned into a pretty serious famine in southern Ethiopia, seeing the rains progressively fail, seeing the crops progressively fail. Um, at that time, I was mapping the baseline water situation in an area about 100 kilometers squared. So I was looking at all the different places where people could collect water. And I was talking and walking with the women and progressively they were having to walk further and further for water, like up to 10, literally up to 10 kilometers um, and I was lucky enough to return to the project area three years later and saw our boreholes up and running and the huge impact of having clean water um, and also people's homes it was so great to see how this had completely changed the lives and opportunities for women and girls there so that's my perspective as a volunteer I would say and Fiona you you started just a drop so that you can make it could make a difference personally and you could bring this into your industry what sort of thoughts do you have on this question um it's a really interesting question and um, and um yes i came from it personally but i was actually coming from it from a from a business perspective um i i think my social conscience came from from being the daughter of a doctor and a nurse but i didn't go into the medical profession i went into the business world um, and so I think in a funny way, um, Just a Drop became a bit of a fusion of both worlds um, because in those early days, I really wanted to encourage business to make a difference to society. I felt the power of business being able to achieve and do that, but it wasn't a very strong focus at that time. Um, and I suppose Just a Drop was an early example of, of corporate social responsibility, but, but now with the impact, the increasing impact of climate change, I think it really does need to become um, an essential part of corporate, environmental and social governance. Um, I, I'm a big believer in what I've sort of coined to be the phrase of the transformational triangle, and it's really sort of based on on my own personal experience, but it, it is about the power of partnership. Um, and it has communities and civil society sitting at its heart, but with government, the business community, and, and the really important NGO third sector community all collaborating in order to achieve the best possible and most effective outcomes, because each therefore brings its own expertise to the party. And, and I genuinely believe that, you know, rather than everybody working in isolation, actually it's by working together that we can get, um, we can achieve so much more because business can be a really good engine driver, um, but we can also do it a lot more effectively because we use the expertise of, of NGOs to actually do the delivery. Um, so I, it's that the power of partnership, I think, is huge. And to just give a very simple, practical example of that, um, one of our partners is um, the international hotel group, Radisson. Um, now, they work across the world and they're working according to local government frameworks, etc. cetera. Um, but what they did, they wanted to impact their water footprint and they developed a towel reuse program within all their properties. And for every 500 towels that were reused, they donated 15 euros to Just a Drop. Um, now, as a result of that 
partnership with their customers donating um, reused towels effectively to the program. Um, collectively, we managed to impact the lives of over 21,000 people across six countries, um, across 24 projects. So I suppose my message is that, you know, thinking small is not a bad thing if you can build it up and you accumulate it. Um, and who would have thought that some reused towels could, could transform that, that many people's lives? And I, and I think it just helps illustrate where Just a Drop sort of came from. It was based on the very simple premise that if each of us gave a little collectively, we could make a difference. And the beauty of Just a Drop is it doesn't take a lot of money to make a difference. You know, 50p will provide clean water to a child in Kenya for a year's schooling, um, three pounds for their entire schooling. Um, so, so my my view, my message is that you know every donation counts, um, and it really does make a difference to the lives of women and girls and children, um, and 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 therefore that that power sits in all of us to make a difference. Um, and I suppose it, it's the one reason that, that that's kept me and and Melissa and Nancy and Kendi and all the all the women that are involved in Just a Drop. Um, as well as the men, but it's what, what keeps us all going because we know we can make a worthwhile um, outcome of it all. Thanks, Fiona. That's a really lovely way to wrap up our, our formal part of, of the session. So didn't I tell you at the beginning that these are fabulous, interesting, dedicated women and, that, and they're all changing the world and we can see that. So what would you like to ask them? Now we've had some questions from the audience already, and I can see that there's a couple of questions in the chat. So let me go to those. Um, let's throw this one to Melissa. Is it not the country government's responsibility to provide a solution to these problems? <laughs> Good question. Ideally, yes. <laughs> Ideally states would provide these services but most of the contexts we work in states have limited capacity. So in the short and medium terms, they're in urgent need of support. So we work with government uh, with a view of strengthening capacity. If you look at our work in Uganda, we have put in these piped water systems into the health centers, but we work very, very closely with the local health departments the whole way through, because it is them who are responsible for maintaining them and checking water quality, so we continue to monitor them, but we've handed them over for them. Um, and also it, when we put together our strategy in a country, we work very closely with the local water, education, health departments to find out how, how best we can support them, you know, what, what their priorities are. So it, it's very important not to, to come in and think we've got all the answers and, and, and ignore government. It's got to be a collaboration where we can, uh, work together with them. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so how do we hold governments accountable to the sustainable development goals? Um, Fiona, Nancy, do one of you want to come in on that? Um, well, uh, if, I, if I go far ahead, then Nancy can maybe, maybe add, because um, well, fundamentally, governments play a key role in, in the development goals and targets. Um, and um, it is our job to hold them to account. Um, no question about it. Um, and in many ways, it's, it's about us really raising awareness of what the sustainable development goals um, stand for and within society. Um, you know, they've... The, these UN Sustainable Development Goals have got a much higher profile now than the Millennium Development Goals. And they, they really provide a fantastic framework for all of us as citizens or businesses or governments to work together and collaborate behind. So they're the most brilliant framework. And so it's our responsibility in, in, in all of our roles, whether in business or with within the third sector or a, or a civil society to hold governments to account. And big international events like COP26 that's going to be taking place in November in Glasgow are excellent um, sort of um, milestones 
for governments to be held to account. Um, and, you know, we have organisations like the Climate Change Committee that help, so other institutions help to hold governments to account as well. Um, and we always can do it in our own ballot boxes, um, not in every country around the world, sadly, but um, certainly it's, it's, it's where um, we can make our voices heard as well as doing what we do day to day. Nancy, do you... Um, you thanks Fiona, anything? actually to be honest I think you've, you've wrapped it up there so thank you, I don't think I have too much to add to that. <laughs> it's, um, it's really hard as moderator not to jump in and answer some of these questions myself so I'm going to take that liberty for a second here and just say um, you know the, the other aspect of both of those questions is that we as a global community are working together to try to raise awareness at the global level. We're, we're working with, uh, with country governments in low and middle income countries to raise their awareness. Um, we're working with both their, their water uh, ministries and their treasury, for example, or influencing prime ministers through global initiatives like Sanitation and Water for All. Um, through the United Nations, through the World Health Organization, and through the, the plethora of NGOs that are out there. So there's activities happening at all different levels. Um, so let me move on to another question from the audience. Uh, I think we had a question about can't people just move, but Kendi, you've already covered that really nicely earlier in the session. Um, there's one here on the chat that says, in the past, I've heard water projects being criticized because the time women spend together fetching water is very valued. I was told that a pipeline in the village can take the opportunity for women to connect with each other and spend time together away from men. Um, and I've heard this criticism, I've heard this, this comment. Um, does, does anybody, Kendi, maybe you um, or, or Melissa, do you, want, do you agree with this and what are your thoughts? Uh, if you want me to, I'll, I'll, I'll start and over to you, Kendi, if you want. But yeah, it's a, it's a good question and, and, and similarly, you know, one that, that I've, you know, come across quite often. And I, I would say, first of all, there's every context is quite different. So for women like who are the in Patisha, who I was referring to earlier, actually, um, water collection is a, quite a solitary thing. And, um, and there's a lot of risks associated with it, risks of, uh, of attack. Um, so it's, it's absolutely critical to put the right solution in for the right context. There's no one size fits all. Um, and yes, you know, it can be, I know sort of villages in, in India where if one, you know, we've, we've gone and we've seen all the women collecting the water together. But at the same time, I visited them later and seeing women all sitting together making baskets. Um, so there's more um, fulfilling ways <laughs> for women to be able to meet, to come together um, and, and use their time in a different way uh, that, that, that's less about drudgery. Um, Kendi, do you, do you want to add to that? Yes, thank you, Melissa. I'd like to add that when the pipelines are channeled to the communities, uh, the group, they are, they are normally constructed by the communities, which is like a self-help group. So these self-help group members have a particular number of people who are selected to run the water, which is like the running of cells. So communities come together to fetch water there. So in most cases, you wouldn't find a woman going alone, like it will pose a very huge risk because the water sold using the pipeline is sold within their community where they know each other. So oftentimes you'll find it is more safer when they're fetching there. Like it's just a few meters away from your home. You just go fetch water and come back. And in addition, most of these communities have other group activities that they do together, aside from fetching water. So they'll still have other activities that bring them together as women. I hope that has answered the question. 
thanks both. So we've got about three minutes left and I see there's a few new questions coming on to the chat. Um, so I'm just going to have to pick and choose a little bit. Um, Hashim asked about common procedures for water pur purification. Um, does somebody want to talk briefly about what, whether we do much in, in water purification and what sorts of techniques we use? Uh, if, if you want, I can come in on that one quickly. Um, uh, uh, again, a variety. So um, we use biosand filters um, quite a lot. So in, in Cambodia, for example, we um, provide household biosand filters. So these are natural um, filters using sand to, to fil filter the water. And we check periodically with water testing to check the quality that's coming through. But these are really sustainable uh, way of, of, of treating water that doesn't involve boiling. Um, and, you know, we, with um, pipe systems, we'll chlorinate and we will test periodically, usually pre and post monsoon, say in India, um, but do regular water testing to check on the quality. Um, and obviously sand dams are a natural filtration system there in Kenya. So, you know, sometimes people will boil um, where we can, we try and avoid that. Um, so also in school tanks, you can, in, um, in Kenya and in Uganda, you can uh, purify in the, in the tank. Um, so ensure all the water's there, they're clean. And we put biosand filters in the schools again in Uganda. So it's a mixture of different solutions depending where we are. Thanks. Um, so there's a couple of questions here about public policy measures. Uh, what public policy measures do you think the British government could put in place to assist programs like Just a Drop? Uh, and uh, how do we envision the sustainability of current and future water projects in the midst of budget cuts in the global community, prioritizing problems at home? Now, I feel a little bit like these might be directed at me, and um, I'm going to claim a little bit of conflict of interest here. I'm wearing my Just a Hat, uh, Just a Drop hat here. Um, so I've got to be a little bit careful, but I will say that, that the UK government does uh, support programs like Just a Drop, and we do have uh, we do have programs in place to be able to do that. Um, things like Aid Match, uh, we have we have support to NGOs. Uh, we have oh gosh, I'm blanking on words, but. Um, you know, when you make payment and and you sign off and you say. Um, it can go to, uh, it can be a donation. What's the term that I'm looking for, Fiona? Grants, grants. Well, no, that's not what I'm thinking of, but yes, we have grants to programs and so on. So um, yeah, there are things there. And yes, I completely agree um, about uh, the issue of budget cuts and problem prioritizing problems at home. It's an issue, we're all facing it. But if anybody have, wants to jump in on any of that, um, I am all ears and listening. I think uh, <clears throat> what, I, what I'd probably add is that, um, you know, and off the back of the pandemic, the one thing that's become very apparent is just how critical access to water is. And um, as in the Western world, have really sort of valued the fact that we can turn on the tap and have access to water to be able to keep our hands clean and be able to use that to protect the NHS. And I think, you know, the work that we're doing with Just a Drop around the world illustrates that actually that's very difficult for, for many people um, and support is required. But I'd say it's a collective responsibility and, you know, we can push government to do as much as it can. But, you know, the wonderful thing about the business world and um, society is that we can be engine room, we can be deliverers and we can be engine rooms. And such a, a positive impetus can come from the business community. Um, and, and we've proven that with, with Just a Drop. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of say it is any one sector's specific responsibility. I think what has got to come out of all of this is a real sense that we all play a role. It's about identifying that role, um, that area of expertise, and then harnessing um, other expertise around you to be able to deliver effectively. And I think that's when you get the best and the most sustainable outcomes. And you have to have the community 
buy in at a local level because that's what ultimately makes it sustainable. So I don't know whether that helps answer the question, but that's my view. <laughs> Thanks, Fiona. And I see our lovely, uh, our lovely participants have saved me and given me the name that I was looking for. It was gift aid that I was trying to find. So thank you to everybody. <laughs> Women of a certain age, sometimes you lose words. Um, Right, so I see that we were doing really well on time and now we're slightly over. Uh, so I apologize for that. There's a fabulous question here from Hashim about, um, about whether Just a Drop has any existing structures to, uh, uh, for linked bonds or for financing um, and whether there's any existing structures uh, or programs in the works. I I think, unless somebody can answer that really quickly, because we're now three minutes over time, I think we might see if there's a way that we can get something out on that um, and get, get back to the participants maybe. Um, and if there's any further questions, uh, Alice, if you in the background have noticed any further questions that we haven't addressed, um, you know, maybe we can, we can get back to the, to the participants with some answers. The only thing I'll say, and very quickly, is no, we don't. But what I would say is that we are interested in understanding any potential ways of um, securing better funding because it's all about securing, um, making organisations that deliver work in the field as sustainable as possible. So actually, if anybody's got any good ideas out there um, and suggestions for just a drop, then we'd be very, very receptive um, to, to those. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thanks, Fiona. On that note, uh, it's 11.04, so I am going to say thank you very, very much to our four panelists. It's been an absolute delight. You are amazing women. Uh, you're inspiring to me, and I hope to some of the panelists, or to, to some of our attendees. Thank you very, very much to all of our participants for being here with us today. Uh, it's been a delight to have you here too. And Alice, I'll just ask you if you want to jump in at the very end to give any kind of comments on how we're going to follow up on this. But thanks everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful day today and a great International Women's Day on Monday.